Last year, I made a series of videos on Teen Titans. In it, I reviewed every episode of the 2003 animated TV show. However, there was one important thing I haven't covered yet, the Teen Titans Trouble in Tokyo movie. And even if you don't have to watch it to understand the TV show, it explores ideas that a lot of fans of the show wanted to see explored. Specifically, the romance between Robin and Starfire. Now, just like with the TV series, it's time to discuss whether or not this film is as great as we remember. I enjoyed all the Teen Titans stuff I watched when I was a kid, but I was way more critical of it now, but I still enjoyed revisiting it, so I expect that the same will be true of this film. Before diving into my review, it's necessary to talk about what happens in the film. Basically, Titan's Tower is attacked by Psychotech. Upon capturing him, the team learns that he was sent by Brushogun, a mysterious villain from Japan, so the team travels to Japan to hunt him down. Let's start with how the film portrays its characters. As expected, Robin, Starfire, Beast Boy, Raven, and Cyborg are all here. However, they aren't equally important. Not even close. In fact, Beast Boy, Raven, and Cyborg are more so accessories. Yeah, they get into fights and have some brief conversations, but none of their involvement here is all that crucial. They could pretty easily be written out of the story without impacting the main plot. In and of itself, this isn't really a problem. Including the credits at the end, the film is only 75 minutes long. Even if it would be nice to see a lot of every one of these characters, it's understandable that some characters get more focus than others. However, a decent amount of time is spent on Raven, Beast Boy, and Cyborg, despite the fact that most of what they do has little to no impact on the plot. Out of these characters, only Raven has any impact, since she learns about Brushogun's past. Even so, any other character could have found that information. There were no events involved with that that showed us important stuff specifically about Raven. Meanwhile, time spent with Beast Boy involves him being chased by girls, singing karaoke, and fighting. All of this adds little to the central plot. Similarly, Cyborg's time eating, running from chefs, and also fighting holds little value, beyond the simple fact that, for fans of the TV show, seeing these characters in action again is enjoyable. At best, their time in this film is simple fun. Or at least, for the most part it is. Okay, so this isn't a huge deal, but it still bothered me, especially after having watched the TV series. Raven is just… off. Specifically, the way she interacts with Beast Boy is different from what I remember of the TV show. Most of their interactions here are characterized by her hitting Beast Boy or just generally being mean to him, often despite having very little reason to do so. While these characters always had their arguments and disagreements, over the course of the series they grew to really care for each other. I suppose this could be the writer's way of showing their closeness in a way that's supposed to be comedic, but if that is the case, I don't think that's the right way to go about this. It made me actively dislike Raven in this movie, despite the fact that she's one of my favorite characters from the TV show. With those three out of the way, let's move on to the two characters who receive the most focus, Starfire and Robin. Here, Robin is dealing with a problem that is typical for his character. While the other Titans seem pretty okay with taking a break, and in some cases even ecstatic about that, Robin is unwilling to. After all, they're heroes, and any time they spend taking a break is time that they could have spent helping people. This results in friction between him and Starfire, as Starfire wants to spend time with him having fun. She wants to be more than just heroes. Considering how often Robin's hyperfocus on hunting down villains has caused problems for him and the team, exploring this is a good idea. After all, I imagine that striking a balance between having fun as a couple and being heroes would be difficult and sometimes even stressful. Also in theory, it lets us see more about Robin and Starfire through having them butt heads a bit, without creating some contrived silly or frustrating misunderstanding between them. In practice though, well, I'm not fond of how the film deals with this. My main reason for this is that Robin and Starfire's relationship isn't explored all that well. Sure, they bond a little bit, but if this is going to be central to the movie, I would have liked to see more of them together. As it stands, there are episodes of the TV show that in 22 minutes or so, provide a more interesting exploration of their relationship. Beyond the fact that this is where their relationship becomes official, we see very little new or different about them. I think this stems from the movie's time being misused. As I mentioned before, a lot of time in this film is spent on Beast Boy, Raven, and Cyborg roaming around Tokyo and doing goofy stuff, as well as action scenes. While it's understandable that the creators would want us to see some of these other characters, after all, people are watching a Teen Titans movie, not a Starfire and Robin movie. They should have been integrated into the plot in a better manner. It would have been better for these characters to somehow show us something more about Robin and Starfire's relationship, instead of having them be so separate from that conflict. Additionally, many of the fight scenes in this film should have been trimmed down to allow for more of the actual story to progress. Still, outside of Robin and Starfire's relationship, there's the way it handles Robin's struggle to view himself as anything other than a hero. If this were the central aspect of the film, then Robin and Starfire's relationship would just be one way of showing the negative elements of that. 
I think that's sort of the case, but the way it handles Robin's struggle is also pretty messy. The villain of this film, Daizo, serves to bring out Robin's internal issues about being a hero. As such, when they first meet, Daizo tries to convince the Titans that Breshogun is a myth. However, Robin isn't convinced, so he continues to investigate. Because of this, Daizo has Robin framed for murder. With this plot, there was some potential for an interesting exploration of Robin's character. Since one of the henchmen of sorts he fights is made of ink, Robin ends up looking like he has blood on his hands, and starts to wonder if he could have actually murdered someone, even if by accident. In execution, however, the issue with this is that we hardly see Robin thinking about that possibility. If more time had been spent here, we could have seen Robin looking at how his seemingly heroic actions led to him potentially hurting someone. He could have realized that his level of investment may have some drawbacks and even lead to him being a worse hero. Even if this seems to be one of the reasons why he finds a better balance between being heroic and relaxing, we hardly see him grapple with the idea that he could have killed someone. Second, it's hard to believe that Robin would believe that he would kill someone, as the color of the ink is pink. It doesn't look anything like blood, so it doesn't look like he has blood on his hands after beating up one of these drawings. Now, this might seem like a weird complaint. After all, in this case, it makes sense that we don't see much of Robin wondering if he killed someone. Why would he consider it much if it's hard to believe? However, it seems that other people are meant to believe that he killed someone, even though it should be obvious that something is up here. Additionally, all it would have taken is a slight change in color, and this plot could have been so much more interesting. It's hard not to see the lost potential. At this point, it feels like the creators of the film didn't really commit to one idea. They didn't commit to either having it be totally unbelievable that Robin could have killed someone, and having Robin wonder if he has killed someone. Perhaps they were forced to make this change because of the very fact that red ink would have looked too much like blood. And this movie was made with children in mind. I can't know for certain, but it would be remiss of me to not at least consider that possibility. Okay, so I'm not fond of how that's handled. But how is the main villain himself? Well, from the get-go, it's abundantly clear that he's the villain. However, I don't view this as much of a problem. Even if having the reveal of the villain be a twist could be interesting, it's by no means necessary for the movie to do that. Still, it does end up feeling silly, since the villain's real identity is hidden for so much of the runtime and treated as though it should be a surprise. But there are far bigger problems than that. Daizo's motivation is simple. He wants to be seen as a hero. As such, he uses Brushergun's powers to create villains and then takes them out himself. That's all there is to it, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's often a good thing if a character's motivation can be described succinctly. It's a sign that they're written in a focused manner. Also, in light of Robin's issues, Daizo seems like a good villain to have here. Robin is obsessed with heroism, and in a way, Daizo is too. Daizo is just a far more negative version of that. He's someone who's so obsessed with being seen as a hero that he becomes the villain. He's motivated purely by outside factors, while Robin seems to be motivated by his moral compass. By his own desire to do good and help people. Simply put, Daizo serves as the villainous version of Robin's mindset. However, this is another case where interesting possibilities are brought forward, but little is done to capitalize on those possibilities. Since the film wants to treat Daizo as a twist of sorts, we only learn his motivations towards the end of the film. Additionally, Daizo and Robin hardly interact. Together, these things mean that, even if there are interesting comparisons to draw between Daizo and Robin, very little is done to hone in on that. As such, the exploration of this contrast is as surface level as Daizo's own heroism. Okay, so I'm not a fan of the film's plot, but that's not all there is to a film. There's also the presentation, stuff like animation, shot composition, music, you know, all that important stuff. So how does the film do with that? Let's start this section off with my favorite part of the film, the music. The music in this is great, and there's a lot to like about it. First, there's the way it incorporates more Japanese sounding elements without having them feel out of place. Despite the tonal and instrumental difference between the TV show and movie that this creates, the music manages to sound like Teen Titans music, but just generally better. It's full of a charming energy that makes me think of my favorite moments from the show. Importantly, it's also full of striking melodies. This isn't simply serviceable music that sets the tone without standing out. It does stand out, and elevates some scenes way beyond what they would otherwise be. This is particularly evident in the multitude of fight scenes. Sometimes the music lines up perfectly with what's happening on screen, which makes the fight scenes hit harder and feel more exciting. Even if I think that some of the time that was spent on fight scenes would have been better spent elsewhere, they're fun to watch. And a lot of that comes down to the music. Actually, I like the soundtrack more on its own than I do the film itself. The animation is far more variable than the soundtrack, but I have no complaints about how it looks during fight scenes. Even if it doesn't reach the levels of the best fights in the TV show, the fights are consistently well animated and directed. Unfortunately, at other moments, the animation is minimal. In some cases, minimal animation can work well, but I don't think that's the case here. Some of the scenes end up feeling more like slideshows than animation. In particular, there's the scene where the Titans are running from Daizo and the Tokyo Troopers. The soundtrack here is great. In fact, this is likely my favorite piece in the film. But the visuals? 
The visuals don't match the music's energy at all. Thus, this chase is void of any tension. Of course, this sort of style could be used to humorous effect, but I didn't find it funny either. All in all, moments like these stand out in a bad way. In the end, after considering all this, I think Teen Titans Trouble in Tokyo is far from great. In fact, unlike the TV series, I found very little enjoyment in it. Sure, the soundtrack is great, but beyond that, not much. Overall, this is a disappointing movie that fails to capture the TV show's enjoyable energy, character dynamics, and humor. Also, it doesn't even come close to the emotional heights of the TV show, to Terra's and Raven's arcs, for example. In fact, if one were to combine the episodes in either of their arcs, they would serve as a better movie of sorts than this. Anyway, what do you think of Trouble in Tokyo? I'm curious to hear about your experiences with this movie and about whether or not you think it's great. Either way, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, I encourage you to check out my series on the Teen Titans TV show. I have the first part to that linked here. Anyway, I hope you have an awesome day. Bye bye for now.